Imagine a place where millions of shape-shifting, glow-in-the-dark creatures gather every night, where you can dive inside a glacier, and if you're not careful, get run over by one, or where you can surf a tidal wave surrounded by mountains. America's national parks and wild places are full of strange creatures and mysterious phenomena, and they preserve and protect some of the most awe-inspiring places on Earth. Our number one all-time strangest experience was so out there, we felt like we were on another planet. Stick around to see if you agree. And join us as we explore our top 10 most bizarre and surreal encounters. Anything called a hoodoo in what looks like a Martian landscape totally belongs on our list. Starting us off at number 10, the largest collection of hoodoos in the world in Bryce Canyon. These crazy looking rock formations are created by wind, rain, and ice that erode soft limestone. At least that's the scientific explanation. The Paiute Indians who lived here more than 800 years ago had their own story. The Paiutes refer to these as the legend people, and it was a group of people who, you know, weren't quite so nice. And one of their deities, the coyote, got mad at them one day and turned them all into stone. Okay. You better be careful. Oh, you better watch <laughs> yourself. Bryce Canyon isn't technically a canyon at all. It's a series of natural amphitheaters, each with dozens and dozens of hoodoos. New ones are being formed all the time, and the old ones eventually fall down. These are some of the coolest rocks I've ever seen in my life. What do you suppose that hoodoo there is named? I'm going to guess that that is Thor's hammer. That's Thor's hammer, okay. right. Thor's hammer is one of the most famous of about two and a half thousand hoodoos in Bryce Canyon. And eventually, that's going to fall over. Oh, wow. Would not want to be on the bottom when Thor's hammer comes that's tumbling true. down. Now, you'd get hammered. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Next on our list, what do you call bugs that suddenly become a flash mob? At number nine, boogie woogie bugs, of course. We ran into these fuzzy little guys near Hot Springs National Park in Arkansas. These are called beach blight aphids, and they're a bunch of little insects that are just covering this ranch right here. And while they look kind of cute, they are actually freeloaders. They suck the sap out of beech trees, leaving behind a black tar-like substance. Not to worry, it doesn't seriously harm the tree. So why do these boogie-woogie bugs like to bust a move? If they're disturbed, they immediately go into this defense where they stick their rear ends up in the air and basically shake them like crazy to try to scare away the predator. And when you have this many aphids all concentrated on one branch, when they're all dancing at the same time, it's quite an amazing display. You wanna do the honors? Sure, let's see why they're called the boogie-woogie. Oh, oh yeah. Oh wow, gosh. They just go nuts. Very cool. Well, should we leave them alone? We should, yeah. <laughs> They danced for us. <laughs> Next up on our countdown of surreal encounters, at number eight, this seemingly endless sea of glistening white sand in White Sands National Park in New Mexico is like no other place on Earth, and it's more explosive than most. At more than 275 square miles, this is the largest deposit of gypsum sand in the world. And that's saying a lot, because gypsum sand is very rare. The basin is surrounded by the San Andreas and Sacramento Mountains. Over time, rainwater dissolved the gypsum in the mountain rocks and washed down here where it created a lake that eventually evaporated, leaving the gypsum behind. So these markers are really your only way of telling your direction out here, because take a look. It is basically just white everywhere. So if you're not looking at these things, there's a good chance you're gonna get lost. And if the wind comes ripping through here, it could be whiteout conditions in an instant. And even though you can't see them, there are actually more than 800 species of animals out here, many not found anywhere else on Earth. Many of them even changing their color to white, to blend in with the sand and to elude predators. I mean, oh, whoa, 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 oh, we got a little lizard. We got a little lizard and he's white. This is camouflage at its finest. Gypsum sand is not like the stuff you find on a beach. This sand will actually dissolve in water, just like sugar. 
That's why it only exists in deserts that get very little rainfall. Even though it's well above 90 degrees here, the sand never gets hot. You can go barefoot in it, but don't try what Colton did. Long sleeves and long pants are highly recommended to protect against sunburn and something else. <laughs> Gosh dang it. <laughs> it's not rubbing in, is it? Well, <laughs> <laughs> you look infected. <laughs> it's the combination of the sand and the sunblock. I'm what feels like a giant walking glue stick. <laughs> and I think that's a lesson learned. <laughs> Another word of warning, don't be surprised if you suddenly feel like you're in a war zone. So as we're hiking out of nowhere, we hear this thunderous roar. Look up to the sky, we don't see any storm clouds, and then we see a missile being launched into the sky. Yep, a missile range the size of Rhode Island and Delaware combined surrounds the National Monument and conducts more than 3,000 missile tests a year. It was established in 1941, and less than a year later, the first atomic bomb was detonated on the range. Definitely a first experience. First hike where you're also, you know, looking at missiles being fired into the sky. While that's hard to believe, I gotta admit, for two guys from Minnesota, we're a little curious about something more down to earth. Is it possible to sled down these hills? As we discovered, it's not only allowed, it's encouraged. Go! No! Not even close, no! baby! No! <laughs> sweet, sweet victory! Oh. You have no idea how bad I wanted that one. Well, I clearly lost that contest, but there's another so-called race in Death Valley that has mystified scientists for decades. Number seven on our list, the mysterious racing rocks of Death Valley. Since the early 1900s, no one could crack the long-standing mystery of why dozens of boulders, some of them weighing more than 700 pounds, seem to sail on their own across the desert floor, some moving just inches and others up to 3,000 feet. This is a huge boulder. And if you look at this track, it's moved quite a long ways. I mean, we're not talking just like a couple of feet. We're talking like hundreds. For decades, no one ever personally witnessed the rocks moving, and scientists had tons of theories. Some thought it might be gravity until they discovered the rocks were moving slightly uphill. Others thought it might be some sort of magnetic force. Look at this. Two rocks separate from one another. They don't look like they were connected. And now look at this. If we follow back their path, they look like they simultaneously moved, came together, and then they followed in completely parallel lines to where they ended up. And I think right there is where you get the term racetrack playa. These two rocks are having their face off. And honestly, looks like we got a good old fashioned tie right now. For all we know, this race is far from over. But the mystery, it seems, has been solved. It gets cold in the desert at night, and in 2014, two scientists just happened to be here when the conditions of wind, water, and ice were just right. These rocks are able to move because of four main factors. Hard ground, rain, ice, and wind. What happens is you've got this hard ground that doesn't really soak up much water. So when the rain falls, it just coats it. And then it freezes into this thin little layer of ice. Then the big winds come in and they push these stones and allow them to just sail across the desert floor. It's amazing what a little weird science and water can accomplish. And that brings us to one of our most unforgettable experiences. Number six, surfing a tidal wave in Alaska. Yeah, you heard me right. We're surfing a tidal wave, which is basically this crazy phenomenon where the tide pushes water up this river, this channel, and it creates a surfable wave. We're talking about the longest wave in America. They're called bore tides, and this is the only one in the United States. The crest can get up to six feet high. Some people mistake these tides for a tsunami, and although they can definitely destroy anything that gets in their way, this combination of hydrology and geography can be a lot of fun. This one on the Turnigan Arm happens every 12 hours, and if you hit it right, you can actually surf for miles up the channel. Is it possible to miss the wave? Yes. How often does that happen? Like, first time people come out here and try it, half of the people miss it. Okay, oh. good. 
So one of us is gonna miserably fail. No. <laughs> We've both surfed the waves off the coast of California, and a good ride is never more than 20 to 30 seconds. This one, if we're lucky enough, could last up to 10 minutes. So right now we can hear this wave. We can see it. It's just like powering straight for us, which is so daunting. Normally you sit and like a wave like appears out of nowhere. This thing we've been watching coming for like a mile or longer, it seems. It's insane. We first got eyes on it, I would say, maybe five, 10 minutes ago. And now it's just inching its way closer and closer and closer. Your heart rate's starting to go and it's about to get real. This is gonna be so intense. Oh man, my heart is just starting to pound. Ah, this is out of this world, just man. Beautiful mountains, epic tidal wave. <laughs> Timing is everything. Jump too soon and the wave will rush over you. Jump too late and it will pass you by. Here we go. We're on it! I am so tempted. <laughs> yeah! Woo! <laughs> yeah! You got it, dude! Yeah, baby! Yes! Yeah, <laughs> baby! Yeah, this is incredible. We nailed it. Eventually, the wave peacefully passes us by, but we've just had the ride of our lives through some of the most beautiful scenery in the world. That was so awesome. Craziest thing in the world to just sit there and listen to this massive wave come at you. It was an absolute roar. I mean, that was like the greatest ride I've ever had in, in any type of water anywhere. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. Alaska never ceases to amaze us and we'll definitely be back. But first, our next stop takes us to a magical forest where all the trees have turned to stone. Number five, the petrified forest in Arizona. This park is all about history, human history, natural history, you name it, fossils, and the signs of dinosaurs and creatures that lived here millions of years ago. And of course, you've got the petrified wood. You look out and just see these mesas and just rolling hills, the vibrant red colors. It's very easy to tell why they call this place the Painted Desert. There are still remnants of an ancient Puebloan village here from around 1200 AD. But the natural history of this area goes back 200 million years ago when this was a tropical forest with 200 foot tall trees. Eventually, volcanic eruptions toppled the trees and rushing rivers buried them in mud and ash without much oxygen. The chemicals in the mud reacted with the wood to form quartz crystals, which permeated the logs and slowly turned them to colorful rock. They were buried for millions of years, but over time, erosion gradually exposed some of the petrified wood and created the largest concentration of petrified wood in the world. Check this out. We're like not even 100 yards into the trail and we're looking at tons of petrified wood. Look at all the colors that are mixed into this. It's so crazy to think that at one point, millions of years ago, this thing was alive. And now it's absolutely solid rock. This is insane. This is petrified wood, but it's also just like an impressively large tree. You know what I'm saying? Like a massive tree. This thing yes. would have been hundreds of years old. This section could have belonged to a tree that was towering 180 feet. And on this land, these trees just, they covered everything. This was a giant rainforest. When you look at the center of it, it's just this beautiful quartz. You would not be able to tell that this was a piece of petrified wood if it wasn't for the outside here which looks like just a living tree right now. Look at this piece right here. The detail and the color and the texture within this piece of wood is just absolutely beautiful. It's gorgeous. And it's because this thing is so beautiful that it could be really tempting to take a piece of this home with you. Don't do it. It's illegal to take any petrified wood home because there'd be nothing left for future generations to enjoy. Get a load of this, you guys. This is a tooth from a crocodile-like animal that was about 24 feet long. Look at that. Paleontologists have found evidence that giant plant-eating reptiles and meat-eating dinosaurs once lived here when this was more like a tropical forest. 
This is why our national parks are so incredible, but also important. The fact that you can walk through and discover these things for yourself, really find a piece of history. Um, but just as important as it is to find it, it's, it's to put it back so other people can have that same experience. And now onto another bizarre environment, also created by a huge volcanic blast. For number four, we're going back to Alaska to Katmai National Park in the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. There are 14 active volcanoes in this park, and in 1912, one of them, Novarupta, blew its top, making it the largest eruption of the 20th century. There was so much ash that it blocked the sun's rays and actually lowered temperatures in the Northern Hemisphere for half a year. And here in Alaska, it buried what used to be a lush green valley and miles of spruce forests. Five years after it happened, an explorer named Robert Griggs discovered an eerie landscape with so many steam vents, he dubbed it the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. Now, most of the steam vents are gone, but 40 square miles of ghost forests and mountains remain buried in 700 feet of sand and ash. Exploring this valley is challenging. There are no trails and wicked winds whip up out of nowhere. If you want to hike to Novarupta, it can easily take several days and requires two river crossings, if you can find the river and a safe place to cross. We've been going for miles and miles. This is where you start to slowly lose your wits. We're starting to get worried. The sun is going down behind the mountain, our water supply is running low, and we keep coming up to gorges that we hope are the river, and they're not. It's 8 p.m. and we're running out of time and options. Suddenly we hear running water, and that's a good sign because we have to cross one more river before we can get to our shelter. Oh my gosh, dude, are you kidding me? Be careful, because this is uh, this is really deep. I know, I'm gonna be careful. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, we just reached the river. It's it's at least 35, 40 feet straight drop down there. We're not crossing here. You gotta be kidding me. You gotta be kidding me. Dude, we could be, we could be absolutely sunk here. We keep following the river, but the current is getting stronger and we've encountered a powerful waterfall. We gotta get going, dude. Man, do you feel that wind? This is the valley I was expecting. The wind is really starting to pick up. It's getting in my eyes, my mouth, and there's absolutely nothing out here to block it. Suddenly, just beyond the waterfall, we spot an opening in the river. We found what we think is gonna be our river crossing. It's widened out between two little narrow sections, which means it's not gonna be as deep and the current won't be roiling like they are, you know, like it is through there. The water here is murky and ash is soft, so often there are 20 to 30 foot drop-offs in the middle of the river that you can't see. Oh. Oh. This water is freezing, so now not only do we have to worry about what we're stepping on and what's ahead of us, we have to worry about our legs cramping up because this is so cold. Alright, here's where the current's picking up, dude, be careful. We have to make sure that every step we take is a strong one because down the river, there's a massive waterfall. So if we fall in, there's a good chance we're going right over it. Is it getting deeper? Uh, it's really silty, so you're gonna, gonna kind of cave in. Oh, it's cold, oh my gosh. Woo! Oh, that's cold. Oh my gosh. Oh! You all right? Yeah, I'm just cold. Oh, oh. Ho, ho, ho. We did it. Man. Ah, it's so cold. Oh, it's like fire. We made it through the worst part. After another day of hiking over mountains and hills covered in ash, we think we're getting close to the volcano. You smell that? Yeah, sulfur. We're just about at the top of the ridge and we're hoping that we don't discover yet another mountain that we have to cross. Wow. Oh. Check that out. Oh, Mountain. there's an overrupta. There it is. You right see it's steaming? Oh my gosh. Yeah! yeah we made right. it! Woo! Yep, that 200 foot high mound of steaming volcanic material is Novarupta. 
When it blew, it spewed out so much ash and magma, it depleted its own supply and then stole some from beneath neighboring Mount Katmai. That mountain also collapsed on itself, forming an 800-foot deep caldera, which is now a lake. Nova Rupta today is acting as a lava plug, which means it's holding down this massive gateway to a huge cauldron of volcanic activity that's underneath it. From one massive volcanic eruption to another just waiting to happen. Number three, the apocalyptic supervolcano beneath Yellowstone National Park and the hotspot wonders it creates. At 55 miles long and 20 miles wide, this supervolcano is under the park. That's more than 1,100 square miles of magma, super hot liquid rock simmering beneath the Earth's surface. There have been three massive eruptions in the past two million years. Another one could wipe out parts of the United States and alter the Earth's climate, but it's not likely to happen for a long time. For now, all that heat and pressure powers half of the Earth's geothermal wonders, geysers, hot springs, mud pots, and steam vents, all in Yellowstone. You left rotten eggs in your pocket again, didn't you? Woo! So when you're around these geysers, it kind of smells like rotten eggs would, but it's actually volcanic gases, one of them being sulfur, and you can smell it for miles. Call me crazy, but when I smell rotten eggs, I think of Yellowstone. Oh, man! When rainwater seeps through the ground and reaches the hot volcanic rocks below the surface, it begins to boil. Superheated water wants to expand, and so that pressure forces the water back up to the surface. It's kind of cool. You can see this smaller one that's just bubbling and just churning up all of this steam. Oh, yeah. Somebody just cranked up the jets on the old yeah, hot tub. Right. Do you see all the scat and everything around that one? It's everywhere. This is Scallop Spring. Bison will congregate around the spring to stay warm during the harsh winters here. But sometimes, they get too close. It's one of the more deadly geysers they have here in Yellowstone. You see how it's like dug into the ground? Animals get too close, they break through the snow and the ice, and it's not a good result. The Grand Prismatic Spring in the Midway Geyser Basin is the largest hot spring in the U.S. and arguably the most awesome. The colorful rings surrounding this massive spring are caused by bacteria that thrive on the rich minerals in the pool. The center is too hot to support life, but the edges are cooler and downright intense. Look at that, dude. You've got red, yellow, orange, green, and blue. That is unbelievable. It's a pretty looking bacteria, I gotta say. Norris Geyser Basin is the hottest and most active spot in the park. Not too long ago, we explored it in winter. It's kind of fun. It's this perfect little path that takes you through almost this alien zone of geysers, hot springs, and all these other geothermal features. One of the most important things to remember is to stay on the boardwalk. It can be extremely dangerous for you, but it's also a fragile ecosystem. I start to see what looks like a stream, but it's bright green. Different temperatures produce different color bacteria. Green's pretty hot, but it's not as hot as the other ones where you get into the blues. The bright colors are a result of thermophiles, microorganisms that thrive in super hot temperatures. Blue water can be more than 200 degrees. It's so cool how you can just by color tell the temperature. Yeah. And you know it's bacteria or algae because they're the only things that can survive in water this hot. Time to turn down the heat now as we return to Alaska and wrangle St. Elias, the largest park in the US. For number two on our list, we're rappelling into a glacier for an incredible, death-defying view of the inside. A Mulan is a huge hole in a glacier carved over time by water making its way through cracks in the ice. The opening to a Mulan can be super dangerous. If you slip on this ice, there's nothing to stop you from sliding down into the hole and dropping 150 feet to the bottom. If you do fall in here, that's it, unfortunately. If by chance we survive the fall, there's a river at the bottom that will sweep us under the glacier where we'd essentially be run over by the glacier and trapped forever. Oh, I can't even see the bottom. Yeah, you won't until we drop you in. Oh, it, it's <laughs> deep. It's really Bottomless deep. pit style, okay. Oh no, <laughs> no, no. The plan is to rappel down and then climb out on our own. We've done some ice climbing before, but nothing like this. I have to say, uh, a little nervous. I, oh, definitely, yeah. I'm on the rope and I start to go down. 
and all of a sudden I start to see just Max getting smaller and smaller and then finally I'm over the lip. I can't see Max anymore and I'm basically on my own down here. That is not a sight you see every day. <laughs> Even from up here, you can just hear the water over a hundred feet down there just going. It's like it's taking these big gulps of air. It's really daunting to be hovering over this river that's flowing beneath you. And knowing that if you fall into this thing, you're never gonna be seen again is really kind of eating away at me. All right, I'm gonna go just a few more feet down. Okay. Suddenly, I'm surrounded by blue ice. It's so incredibly vibrant and amazing. But at the same time, I know that this ice is much more compressed than the ice that we practiced on. That means it's harder to drive an ax into it, which could make it harder for me to climb out of this thing. Here goes nothing. This is what I was afraid of. Finally, the blade sinks in about half an inch, but most of my weight is on the crampons. It's so crazy to be relying on tools that are only going in maybe an inch to this ice, but they're supporting my weight somehow. My crampons are going in perfectly. I'm placing my ice axes and I'm moving up this thing really quickly. All right, nice job, Woo! man. Welcome back. Oh, you got a little wet. I did. Man, I got down there and I thought like, okay, you've gone down a little too far. And then I started climbing, I'm like, this isn't that bad. Yeah, no, like, it's not. All right. Finally, it's my turn to go into the Mulan. As I start to back up, the edge is getting closer and closer and I go over the whip, and I can finally see the bottom of this thing. You got it, dude. Whoa! At first, I can't seem to get a grip. Thank goodness for the rope. Colton's getting out of his comfort zone. I have a feeling we're about to hear a bunch of holy cows, maybe some oh my goshes. So be prepared. We're gonna hear some yelling. Oh, oh my gosh. This is incredible. Never ceases to amaze me how far that kid's voice can carry. <laughs> you can feel the drops of water coming down all around you. That water becomes a lubricant that helps the glacier slide over the ground. 81% of the world is covered in water and ice. And right here, my world is completely covered in water and ice. <laughs> Wow, this is amazing. Oh my gosh. I'm taking Jack's advice, going down deeper into the blue ice. Woo! I could probably sit right here and stare at this forever, but I should probably start climbing because <laughs> it's going to get cold real fast. Wow, look at this ice. Oh man. Woo! Pretty sweet, right? Oh my gosh, is that amazing! <laughs> yeah. Amazing! What a wonderful world! The moment you come over that lip and you see just the abyss and this perfectly carved cylinder of rushing water, I could have hung there forever. That was so beautiful. Now you might be wondering how we could possibly top that. Leave it to the national parks to continually amaze us. It's time for our absolute favorite and most surreal encounter of all time, which happens to be the largest migration of animals on Earth. We're scuba diving off the coast of the island of Hawaii over a 7,000 foot drop off where every night, millions of bioluminescent creatures who've never seen the light of day migrate towards the ocean's surface to feed. We'll be diving down to about 40 feet, but we'll stay tethered to the boat because it's easy to get turned around down here. Trouble is, we won't be alone. As I descend, I'm definitely overcome with some anxiety. There are tons of different types of sharks that are definitely in the area. And that includes tiger sharks that are second only to great white sharks in fatal attacks on humans. The darkness that surrounds us is definitely daunting, but it also is intriguing. A blackwater dive like this is almost as close to feeling like you're in outer space as humanly possible on Earth. You are weightless, floating through this endless abyss.
All around me are these crazy creatures that have these amazing colors and this complexity that I've never seen before. Some of these creatures look like jellyfish. Other creatures look like long translucent worms or almost the tentacle from an octopus. Most of the animals we're seeing are coming from a depth of 650 to 3,200 feet below the surface. Some are flashing bright white lights. Others have streaks of green going up and down the outside of their bodies. And just when we think we've seen it all, we witness something that rivals anything Hollywood could dream up. One of these creatures looks like an elaborate spider web, and I'm staring at this thing, and as it gets closer to me, it all of a sudden just shrinks back into itself and turns into what looks like a snake and just slithers away. Seriously, I have no clue how it does that or why, but it's one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Right now, I feel so absolutely out of this world, but at the same time, I almost feel so much closer to it. I feel intertwined with this ocean. Just like these organisms, here I am, floating in the blackness. That was probably the most wonderful, awe-inspiring thing I have ever experienced. I did not feel like I was on this earth. I mean, it was that foreign, it was that extraterrestrial in nature that I felt like I was just gliding through a sci-fi movie. And what was amazing is seeing some of these creatures that were so big, and then the closer you would get, they would notice you, and then they would go back together and form this like really solid entity. I've never been more intrigued. I've never been more fascinated. I've never wanted to know more about our oceans. And that's the beauty of the national parks. They never cease to amaze us. And just when we think we've seen it all, nature astounds us once again. So even though we plan our adventures and think we know what to expect, our best encounters are always the unexpected. Here's wishing you some surprises the next time you venture out into nature. For more information, please check out the links below and feel free to leave a comment. And if you like this video, please subscribe to our channel where you'll find more travel and adventure tips like this one and full episodes of Rock the Park.